from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Wanted to tell you about just how amazing she is, in case you didn't already know, but I figure you wouldn't be here in the rain if you didn't already have some suspicion that Koki Roberts is pretty amazing. First, I want to make a quick announcement, and I'm impressed that so many of you are willing to stand, so we will try and get going here. But first, um, I want to tell you all that on behalf of the, Nas the Library of Congress and First Lady Laura Bush, first of all, welcome to the National Book Festival. I've been coming for many years. I hope all of you who have been coming for many years think it's getting even better. I think it is. And if you're a first timer to the National Book Festival, well, now you know why it's so special. We hope you're having a wonderful day, and we appreciate you being out here to celebrate the joy of reading. But before we begin, I want to let you know that all of the presentations in this pavilion are being filmed for the Library of Congress, for their website, and for their archives, and by C-SPAN for airing on Book TV, which I'm a little horrified by because we're all having a bad hair day, right? <laughs> I thought I could get away with it, but no. So I want you to be mindful of that as you enjoy the presentation. And um, please don't sit on the camera risers um, because it really does jiggle the cameras and it makes it look like all kinds of weird things are going on during the presentation when they're not. So let me begin by telling you a little bit about Cokie Roberts. I'll start with the obvious. She's a famous New York Times bestselling author. Um, as many of you know, her works included We Are Our Mother's Daughter, um, she had such success with founding mothers, the women who raised our nation, that now we get to hear more about what's really, in essence, the sequel, Ladies of Liberty, the Women Who Shaped Our Nation, um, which now is number one on Amazon's uh, book of historical books about women. Um, it really talks about so many different ways that the early uh, women of our country shaped this nation in ways that many of us never even suspected through tireless research and um, examination of letters. As uh, many of you know from reading the books and as Koki will tell you, uh, for example, both Martha Washington and Martha Jefferson's letters were all burned. And it was through tireless work by Koki and uh, a historian who worked with her that they were able to dig up just enough letters that they were able to really fill out the pieces um, about these amazing women and tell us more about them. But about the amazing woman who wrote this book, what I find particularly impressive about Cokie Roberts is that she has become so famous in her own right when she grew up being the daughter of, and then she became the wife of. Cokie is the daughter of Hale and Lindy Boggs. Hale Boggs, for all of you students of history, will know that he was our Speaker of the House before he tragically died in a plane accident while on congressional business. Lindy Boggs, his wife, then ran for his seat and won and not only became one of the longest serving and most respected members of the House of Representatives, but later became a respected ambassador um, serving, I believe, did your mother serve Italy? What, did she serve? She served the Vatican, of course, because they're also a, a dedicated family to the Catholic Church here in Washington. Um, and so Koki grew up being the daughter of and then, as many of you will recall, she became the wife of, because Steve Roberts, who is one of the most beloved people here in Washington, was also one of the most influential journalists of his time, uh, covering the White House for the New York Times, and was one of those early people who was brave enough to go on television and talk about politics in a time when few print reporters were brave enough to go there. Um, but as you know, Koki began to make a name for herself. She had two small children, but decided that she was going to um, advance her education and then advance her career and worked her way through the ranks at National Public Radio, where I first got to know her as the congressional correspondent at NPR when I worked for Senator Boren, and then, of course, became one of the most influential television journalists when she hosted This Week with Sam Donaldson and Cokie Roberts. And when she left the show, her presence was so sorely missed um, both within the building at ABC and outside, that she came back by popular demand. <laughs> so we are still very lucky in the ABC family that she's still very much a part of that show and continues uh, to do that work and uh, is continuing along with all of that to do her writing as well. I just wanted to share with you one story to tell you about the balancing act that Koki has somehow perfected. When I was at ABC News, I'm now at ABC 7 News, I have three small children and I didn't want to travel so much, so I moved to the local station where I could still cover the White House and cover Congress, but not travel so much. 
But while I was at ABC, I was trying to move from New York to Washington. And um, so I interviewed with Koki for a job at This Week, and I ended up uh, going uh, to Good Morning America. But in the job interview, Koki said to me, do you have any children? And I said, no, not yet. And she said, well, if you don't have any now and you don't start having them soon, I'm going to start getting on you because it's a really a wonderful thing to do, and you can't let this career stop you from having the wonderful pleasure of motherhood. And I can guarantee you, she is the first boss in network news, and so far the last boss in network news, to ever tell me that she was going to encourage me to go out and have kids and do the balancing act that she has done so well for so long. Please give a warm round of applause for the wonderful Koki Roberts. up here looking like a bag lady, right? <laughs> well, what a treat. What a wonderful festival we have had today. And, you know, it's just, I am, I am so excited about this book festival. And Jim Billington and Marjorie Billington, Susan's here too. Um, the, the work that they have done uh, with Mrs. Bush uh, to put this together is just Look at this. We have hundreds of thousands of people coming from all over the country. People came through the line uh, for me to sign books from everywhere, including a wonderful book group, the Literary Dames from Tampa, Florida. And um, uh, to everybody here, no matter the rain, the sun, the wind, the hot, the cold, you know, all day we've had every weather, and, um, and all about books. I mean, that is the most exciting thing, and I, I tell you, our big job guys, all of us guys here, uh, from wherever you are in the country, whomever is elected on November 4th, the first thing you do is get a letter to the First Lady saying, make sure the book festival goes on. <laughs> and um, it is just one of the many ways that Jim Billington has has worked to try to bring the library to the people. Because the building is wonderful, of course. It's this gorgeous building that houses the biggest collection in the world, literally, of books and movies and music and all of that. Uh, but he has also knows that not everybody can make their way into that mosaic masterpiece. And so uh, he is bringing the works of the library to the world uh, on the internet. Uh, so it is terribly important for all of us, and particularly important for those of us who uh, like to do historic research, uh, because you know it's a lot easier to do it in your pajamas at home. <laughs> and um, it is appropriate that I, it should be at a festival. Uh, First Lady helped found that I should talk about this book, Ladies of Liberty, because they are um, her ancestors uh, in the great work of of perfecting this union, which part, this literary, uh, this book festival is part of. It's part of the perfection of the union. And, um, and these are such great ladies. And I, I came to them initially uh, because I had seen my mother and her cronies, Rebecca has revealed my true identity, and um, uh, saw them in the 1940s and 50s in Washington running everything. They ran you know, their husband's political campaigns, they ran the political conventions, they ran the voter registration drives, of course they ran us kids, and um, along with the African American women here in Washington, they ran all the social service agencies. So I knew they did everything, and, um, and I was always very interested in the, the founding period because I have to deal with these founding fathers so much. You know, They are constantly invoked on the floors of Congress, um, usually incorrectly, by the way, uh, really almost always incorrectly, and um, on the campaign trail, of course, in the courtroom. So I felt like I was on a first name basis with these guys, some of whom I liked better than others, and um, didn't know anything about the women. You know, Jim Billington's always making this wonderful testimony to Thomas Jefferson about selling his library to create the Library of Congress's first great collection. Well, he sold it because he was broke. And um, his, his daughter, Martha, who was trying desperately to keep Monticello going when, when he had all these people coming through, uh, one of his uh, biographers in the 19th century came, asked her son, 
How was the, the, what was the biggest number of drop bys for the night that your mother had? And he said, 50. And uh, so she was, you know, have to put up 50 people she didn't expect for the night, feed them all, of course, give them fine wines, and they went broke. And, um, and so fortunately, when the British burned the capital, there were books to be had, and, um, and Martha Jefferson was probably really glad to get rid of them, if the truth be told, <laughs> and she needed the money. But um, so I, I started this work of uh, getting to know these women. And because I, when I went to learn about the women of this period, I, I discovered no one had really done the work of looking at their political lives, pulling them together, seeing how they coordinated with the women uh, in, the, uh, in education and writing and social reformers and all of that. And the Library of Congress is, again, wonderfully helpful. Sheridan Harvey, who's been my escort today, was one of the first people to help out. Uh, and it has really uh, been a great resource. But the truth is a lot of these women's papers were not saved or were not honored. So they were not easy to come by. And, um, and it was hard work to, to pull together uh, these books. Uh, I thought it would only be one book, uh, just going from the time before the revolution to John Quincy Adams, which is uh, the end of the founding period. I mean, the voters made it easy. They literally elected the next, elect, uh, next generation. But that was getting to be way too big a book, so I, um, and I would have never made the deadline. So I stopped that book, um, The Founding Mothers, with the election of John Adams, which was the first contested election under the new Constitution. And the fact that the loser, Thomas Jefferson, um, accepted the consequences meant that the the experiment would continue, at least for a while. You know, we, we take so for granted that the loser accepts the consequences, but it's a big deal. And, um, you know, you see it today in Zimbabwe, that uh, the, the, you can't, the, the loser just refuses to, because he's the, he, was the, he was the ruler, accept that he lost, and, uh, and there has been a uh, crisis ever since. I must say, in the Democratic nomination process, I thought it might have happened this year. But, um, <laughs> but so that book ended there, and this book goes from Adams to Adams. And, um, and that means that um, it starts with Abigail Adams as First Lady. And the truth is, you know, Abigail Adams was a great um, political analyst and a political advisor to John Adams all of his life. And, you know, he was away for long periods of time, and she was left, you know, to run the farm and, and take care of the children and the old people, of course. And, oh, by the way, the British were coming. And um, but at one point he said to her, if it gets really dangerous, take our children and fly to the woods. <laughs> oh, thank you, John. Um, <laughs> hope you're having a nice dinner in Philadelphia. But, um, but the truth is, when she became First Lady, she lost her political judgment. And I have seen this happen in so many White Houses. You know, um, I've known them pretty well since the Johnson White House. And what tends to happen is a bunker mentality sets in. And people in the White House feel like, you know, we're on the inside doing the good, the true, the just, and the right, staying up late, eating bad food. And you on the outside are not understanding our great uh, sacrifice. And why are you being so awful to us? And um, she very much did feel that way. Uh, she, um, she became very suspicious of the press and of the opposition. Now, of course, the opposition was led by their own vice president, uh, Thomas Jefferson, and the press was horrendous, you know. I mean, they, you think we're bad. Um, they, she kept talking about the scurrility of the press, which is a wonderful word, which I think we must bring back. <laughs> Spell check hates it, you know, but... Um, and so she became a tremendous supporter, an ardent advocate for the Alien and Sedition Acts. And of course, they went a long way to doing in Adams uh, when he ran for re-election because they were wildly unpopular and probably unconstitutional. And, um, and she had advised him badly. Um, but of course, the real thing that did him in as president, and she was clear on this, was Alexander Hamilton. And, um, and uh, his treatise against Adams really cooked Adams' goose. And Abigail had never trusted Hamilton. She called him Caesar or Cassius, whichever Roman she didn't like at the moment. And the, um, um, she 
felt uh, justified in not liking him when he had to admit to having had an extramarital affair, which he had had to do because he was being blackmailed and he was accused of being blackmailed for trading illegally in treasury securities and he had to go public and say, no, 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 it's not that. I was being blackmailed uh, because I was having an affair with the blackmailer's wife. And he says, I do not say this without a blush. And um, <laughs> Eliza Hamilton stood by her man, as we have seen so many political wives do since. I mean, in recent months, it's really gotten tough. And um, they all wear the same clothes and um, pearls. They all wear pearls. Um, <laughs> And in fact, I was making that joke the other day, and a woman sent me up a note and said, pearls behind swine. <laughs> it's so great. But at any rate, Eliza Hamilton was the first. She stood by her man, saved his political career, let him live to fight another day, and the man he chose to fight was John Adams, and uh, John Adams lost the presidency. Thomas Jefferson becomes president. By now, Washington is the capital. It's this funny little city. And it serves as kind of a leap motif through this book because people would arrive and say, where are we? What is this place? It's all mud, as we can feel. Um, and you know, there's nothing here. And then they'd get used to it. And they'd write these letters saying, but the circus has come to town, and the theater is here, and there's some bridges, and it's really quite pleasant. And then new people would arrive and say, where are we? What is this place? Thomas Jefferson, of course, did not have a first lady. Uh, and there's a lot written about Dolly Madison serving in that role, and she did from time to time. And he would call her in a panic saying, you know, I need someone to help entertain the ladies of the place. But um, basically what Dolly Madison did was set up a separate power base of her own at the F Street House. And she was really a remarkable person. And what I came to understand in Founding Mothers, what I was surprised about and and so interested in was how deeply political these women were and how incredibly patriotic they were all through the revolution when they were making all these sacrifices for the cause. In this book, what uh, interested me so much was that they um, were not only political and politically influential, but that they were recognized and given uh, the uh, credit for their political um, power uh, by men. And that, you know, in the early 19th century is really quite remarkable. So that, for instance, uh, by the time Madison ran for president, Jefferson had been a popular president. Uh, he, was, he was the writer of the Declaration. He could be charming when he wanted to be. The Louisiana Purchase was extremely popular. Well, but by the time he left the presidency, he wasn't paying much attention. France and Britain were at war, interfering with our shipping. We didn't want to go to war. Jefferson didn't want to go to war. And so the, he and Madison uh, convinced Congress to pass an embargo act, which everybody hated. Uh, the shippers hated it because they couldn't work. The merchants hated it because they couldn't import anything. The farmers hated it because they couldn't export anything. And so Madison was having a tough time uh, without any of Jefferson's charisma uh, getting elected president. But he had a secret weapon. And as Charles Coatsworth Pinckney, his opponent, said, I was beaten by Mr. and Mrs. Madison. I might have had a better chance if I had faced Mr. Madison alone. <laughs> it's quite a statement. And, um, and listen, if you think, by the way, and this is why having newspapers online and the kinds of things that are now happening in the library is so important because you can put the present in context. If you think this is a nasty election, which by the way, I don't, I mean, even by modern standards, but if you do, let me introduce you to the election of 1808, uh, when Dolly Madison was accused in the public press of being overly sexed and unsexing her husband. And uh, one newspaper wrote that Thomas Jefferson had pimped Dolly Madison and her sisters in exchange for votes in Congress. <laughs> Doesn't get much nastier than that. Um, but she sailed through it and, uh, you know, with feathers in her turbans and, and had everyone in entertain the world uh, 
made everyone think that she was their friend and that maybe he was as well. Henry Clay said to her at once, everybody loves Mrs. Madison. And she said, well, that's because Mrs. Madison loves everybody. Now, actually, I've read her mail. That is not true. Um, but she made a good showing of it, and she was a great people person. But by the time of the second election in 1812, Madison was wildly unpopular. The war was unpopular, Mr. Madison's war. The Republican Party had splintered. Uh, a faction had nominated DeWitt Clinton from New York. The Federalists decided, well, that was the way for them to get back in power, was to back Clinton as well. Uh, the popular vote was very close, but Madison won handily in the Electoral College, the men that Dolly Madison had wined and dined. And uh, later in the century, James G. Blaine wrote, Mrs. Madison saved the administration of her husband, but for her, DeWitt Clinton would have been chosen president in 1812. So it's a fairly unequivocal uh, statement. Then, of course, the British invade Washington, and she is a great heroine. And, um, and hers, her own story about saving Washington's portrait is really something to read. And there are contemporaneous accounts, which I found from other people in Washington at the time. Uh, so any questioning of that story is really completely buttressed by those accounts. She became this great national heroine, came back to Washington, got, helped get the city back on its feet, and then uh, worked, as my mother and her friends had, with the women of Washington uh, to found an orphanage uh, because many children had been left uh, parentless as a result of the British invasion. And she was joining at that moment a group of social reformers who were working around the country to create a social safety net as this exuberant, expanding country, full of excitement, was growing and, and uh, people were uh, very, you know, making it with uh, unbridled capitalism. But not everybody was making it. And these women understood that and founded benevolent societies and widows' societies and orphanages. And these were highly political acts. They had to go to state legislatures and get the, uh, the incorporation uh, papers to do that and then uh, go to the public and, and uh, ask for funds. And um, they were you know, having to engage in politics to do this, but they did it because they saw people being left behind. Well, here's where the research becomes wonderful. So Dolly had helped found the orphanage. She then goes home. James Monroe becomes president. But everybody knows he's going to be the last uh, pre president of the revolutionary generation. Um, he is the last of the cocked hats, they call him. And they know he's likely to run again, and he runs in 1816, uh, uh, and they know he's likely to run again if he lives in 1820 and get elected because the two-term uh, tradition had been established. Um, but that didn't stop everybody from starting to run for the president. Again, if you think this is the longest campaign, the campaign of 1824, the one that was going to be the first of the new generation, started in 1818, <laughs> six years before the election, uh, when state legislatures started nominating these people. And then they all ended up in Washington, and either in the cabinet or in the Congress, and they were all campaigning here. And Louisa Catherine Adams, John Quincy Adams' wife, uh, was, was, he was Secretary of State, and she is managing his campaign, and she described it that way in these private letters, most of which have never seen the light of day. And um, she was writing these wonderful letters home to old John Adams. Abigail had died in 1818, and she was amusing him with these letters. And she talked about my campaign to get her husband elected president, my vocation to get him elected president. She knew what she was doing in all of her entertainments. But um, in the year 1820, it was the year of the Missouri Compromise. And Congress had stayed in session much longer than usual. Usually they left in March. And uh, this year, they were here until late May. And it was a disaster. The city was running out of food. They didn't know what to do with all these congressmen. And uh, finally, they leave in late May. In June, she goes to a meeting of the trustees of the orphan asylum. And, and no one has ever published this letter. And I was reading this letter, and I could not believe what I was reading. It was so fabulous. 
In June, she goes to a meeting. The women say to her, we're going to need a new building next year. She says, why? What are you talking about? She said, well, Congress having left many females in such difficulties as to make it probable they will beg our assistance. Louisa says, what do you mean? The woman says, the session had been very long. The fathers of the nation had left 40 cases to be provided for by the public, and our institution was the most likely to be called upon to maintain this illicit progeny. 40 pregnant women left behind by the Congress. And she says, so she says to John Adams, I recommended a petition to Congress next session for that great and moral body to establish a foundling institution and should certainly move that the two additional dollars a day which they have given themselves as an increase in pay may be appropriated as a fund toward the support of the institution. Now, it doesn't get any better than that. You know, I mean, be sure you have not read this in any book by a guy historian. <laughs> but it does give you a sense of the times. Um, and, um, and that is what's so wonderful about these women's letters. Um, there is, with the exception of maybe five quotations in this book, every single one is written either by a woman, to a woman, or about a woman. And um, that's very unusual in a history book. And thank you. And that was a gentleman starting that, thank you. But what that does is not only introduce you to the other half of humankind, by the by, uh, but, um, but also you get a completely different view of the men uh, from these letters. Because the men knew they were doing something extraordinary. And they knew if they succeeded, their letters would be preserved and published and poured over by posterity. And so they were formal and stiff and pompous in their letters to each other. In their letters to the women, they are much looser and filled with their fears and their longings and their loves and their humor um, and their predicaments. I mean, John Marshall at one point wrote to his wife from the road that he had gone riding the circuit and discovered he had no britches. And um, he said he could hoped he could find a a tailor in Raleigh, North Carolina, to make him some, but they were all busy, so he would have to pass the rest of the term without that important article of clothing. Now, what was he wearing? You know, I can't look at him anymore. You see, I sort of avert my gaze. But, um, but so you, you know, we think of these men as these marble and bronze deities. And of course, their wives did not think of them that way. And, um, and I think getting to know them getting to know these founders uh, through, as whole people, as flesh and blood, three-dimensional people, as well as getting to know their wives, is just such a, a special way of getting to know uh, this period. And so um, I, I really loved it, finding them. But you know, the period did finally come to an end. John Quincy Adams was elected with Louise's great help. Um, and, um, and the founders had handed over uh, this great experiment to the next generation. And Abigail Adams could be counted on to be the person who would know that that was going to be hard. And so before she left public office, uh, which is the way she described it, she wrote what I think of as something of a benediction to the founders and to the founding period. She said, I leave to time the, unfound, the, the unfolding of a drama. I leave to posterity to reflect upon the times past, and I leave them characters to contemplate. So these are great characters to contemplate. I very much enjoy letting you letting me share them with you today. Thank you so very, very much. Time for questions or no? Um, one question, I'm told. Who's going to be the lucky person? <laughs> let's, let's go into overtime for two questions. We'll take two questions. We'll take one from this side and one from that side. OK. Uh, anyone right here? Go ahead. Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Right. Uh, OK. Hang on. We're going to start right here with the mic. Go ahead. 
Um, Will, oh, excuse me. Okay, go ahead. Will Durant has been his, invoked twice or three times earlier today. And um, I don't have the quote exactly right, but I think he said something about the um, civilization being uh, like a river and, and, and historians pay attention to what's down the river, battles and blood and guts and everything. But civilization is actually what goes on on the banks of the river. And, and, and thank you very much for bringing out uh, stories from the banks of the thank river. Thank you, thank you. Well, of course, Ariel Durand was also a wonderful historian, so yeah. we should mention her as well. A, a lady here asked me about my mother's work influencing me. Of course it did, tremendously. Uh, my mother, Lindy Boggs, is a, a wonderful inspiration, a delightful person. She, did, uh, she is an historian herself. She and Jim worked together on several bicentennials. And, um, and her work in politics has been you know, very much something that I have um, admired and venerated. Thank you. Over here, was there one? Okay, Hello? One more. I'm telling you. Uh, I don't I'm wondering if you could uh, tell the audience uh, how you got the nickname Koki, what your given name is, just out of curiosity. But two, uh, these women contributed to the to the political process, even though they couldn't vote. Uh, could you speak to responsibilities of citizens once once the voting is over? That's the hiring decision. Uh, what citizens should be doing okay. between elections? All right. Well, the um, well the women were very active between elections. Heaven knows. And, uh, and the fact that they couldn't vote was ridiculous, but it, it does show you that you can be politically influential without the vote. So think how much more politically influential you are with the vote. And um, that, if there's any young person in this audience, I certainly hope you remember that and take that home. Um, and I can't remember, a Koki. My name is Mary Martha Kareen Morrison Claiborne Boggs Roberts. It is your basic Southern Catholic name. Um, my brother Tommy couldn't pronounce Corrine a mere 64 years ago. Uh, so when I came home from the hospital, he called me Koki, and here I am. And it's so nice to be here with you. Thank you very, very much. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.